Good morning, ma'am. Would you introduce yourself? Tell us your name and DOC number, please. Tiffany Dickerson, uh, 5520063. And good morning, Ms. Dickerson. Uh, let me acknowledge the folks you have there with you. Let's see. You have your mother, uh, Ms. Gwen. Is it right? Yes, yes ma'am. Ma Gregory Jones, Dijon Nixon, Jessica Dickerson, Alicia Williams, Brandon Dickerson, Lisa Johnson, Jeremiah Jones, Felicia Dickerson, and Rose Jones. Are any of your guests who are there with you going to speak on your behalf? Yes, ma'am. Who would that be? There's two. I have room for two. Jessica Dickerson and Lisa Johnson. Okay, here with us in Baton Rouge, we have uh, Brenda Victor. She must be on Zoom. Cynthia DeQueer. Anita Mosley. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Shalonda. Demetrius. I can't say. More. Okay. So did I miss somebody who's here? I'll be Chris's chair. Yeah. Um, and I have Brenda Victor will be speaking. No, she's she just called to talk to her. She's she's okay. So Ms. Victor is on Zoom. So uh Jeremy, will you be speaking? No. All right. So um let me just read some identifying information into the record, Ms. Dickerson, and then we'll get started with the interview process. Uh, you're here this morning uh, seeking a commutation of your sentence. You were sentenced in uh, April 2009 in the Foosh Parish uh, for a manslaughter conviction. You received a 25-year sentence. Ms. Dickerson, is that information right? Yes, ma'am. All right. Your case this morning has been assigned to Mr. Roche. Uh, would you answer any questions he may have, please? Thank you, Madam Chairman. Good morning, Ms. Dickerson. How are you? Nervous. Nervous? Okay, sit back, take a deep breath, relax, and we're going to have a conversation. Okay? Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Chairman, fellow board members, we this morning we have Tiffany Dickerson, DOC number 552-063. Ms. Dickerson is here this morning seeking a recommendation for a commutation of sentence or an update in a parole eligibility date. Ms. Dickerson already has a good time release date of October 23rd, 2027. Um, she's seeking this compensation for a 209 conviction for manslaughter and a stabbing death of a longtime companion who she actually went mm -hmm. to high school with. And after high school, she moved in, they moved in together, but had a very long history of domestic abuse issues. On October 16, 2007, she was arrested in the stabbing of Ryan. The original arrest warrant was issued for manslaughter. But after the detectives interviewed the offender and witnesses collected all evidence from the crime scene and discovered a long history of domestic violence, they decided to uh, change the warrant to second degree murder. On April 20th, 2009, 18 months after the arrest, Ms. Dickinson entered a plea of guilty to manslaughter and was sentenced to 25 years at hard labor at DOC. Ms. Dickerson is currently 50 years old and she was 34 years, 34 years old 
at the time of the stabbing. He's, in the, he's been incarcerated for the last 15 and a half years. Ms. Dickerson, how long after graduation from high school did you move in with Brian? It was, I believe it was a few years after. Um, and you made a statement that you were a domestic violent situation, both you and Brian were aggressive at different times, but you said you loved each other so you stayed together. Is that correct? Were you guys both physically abusive towards one another? That's what he's asking. Yes, sir. There, there were incidents where you were accused of hitting Brian uh, with a close fist and in a, in a head area. And in one case, you were at a nightclub and he made advances or look at another female and you use that high heel shoe to hit him in the head. Is that correct? Yes, sir. So tell me exactly what happened on the night that the stab in the court. You gave different at different times to the police and different interviews. So we need to know that your version that was given at different times, we need to know exactly what happened that night that caused the death of Ryan. <laughs> Um, it was the morning of Brian and I were arguing. We were having a disagreement and it led to an argument, a bad argument. And eventually it escalated to something physical and we were fighting. And then at the heat of the moment, I reacted and I grabbed the knife and I stabbed and killed someone that I love. The police report said that you were in a kitchen and you were preparing a meal and you were chopping seasoning. Is that correct? Yes, that's where the disagreement came in at. Okay. And what was the disagreement? It was the cooking and it was the remote and it was the TV. It was everything. So actually you, you were watching something on TV and he took the remote control and changed the channel. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Why were you so angry? He was fussing and cursing. Cursing me out. Okay. And I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave this this area for it to do. I just have one question. Why didn't you remove yourself from that situation? Because I love you. Okay. okay. Let's continue. Uh, opposition in this case comes from the DA's office in the Bush Parish. 
the sheriff's office in the first parish and multiple members of the victim's family, his daughter, his sister, his mother said in the statement, she feels like he's willing to forgive. God would forgive in this situation, but she did not mention whether she was opposed or unopposed. So the victim's mother is neutral and said that God would forgive and she felt that she should forgive also. I thought you need to know that. Uh, Ms. Dickinson has a low risk assessment. She has a moderate needs assessment, which is a little concerning to me. She's housed in minimum custody. She has a GED. She has a very good institutional record. As a matter of fact, in 15 years, of incarceration, he has only one law court write up. He has no serious write ups in 15 and a half years of incarceration. Let me switch to your most current uh, institutional record. As I said before, Ms. Ms. Dickinson is 50 years old. She's in minimum custody, low risk assessment. She has a GED. She has a social degree. She has a bachelor's degree in, in 2020, a certification in serve safe in 2020, reentry in 2021, programs. And I'm going to have you to go over your program, but let's start with the True Freedom Program that you completed in 2011. So tell us about your other programs. Um, um, I've done Courage for Life, Trauma Healing, spiritual leadership, prison fellowship, school of righteousness. And I'm currently in a class called Victim Impact. I've been in it for seven weeks. And out of all the classes I've taken, that class there means the most to me because I'm learning how to take the focus off myself and focus on the people that I've harmed and the impact that what I did, how it makes them feel. So let me fill in a little, little bit more for you. Uh, she completed Living in Balance, parts one and two, Celebrate Recovery. Um, she's written an accountability, uh, victim accountability letter. Uh, <clears throat> Prison Fellowship Academy. Tell me about the Prison Fellowship Academy. It's a class that um, teaches us about the Word of God, forgiveness, it's all about God. And you've also completed 100 hours pre-release, okay? Yes. And you belong to the Culinary Arts Club. Tell me about that. And are you a cook at the uh, facility? Um, no, sir. Um, that club teaches us about um, being active in the food and beverage industry, along with other club members. Um, things that you learn in there you can take outside of uh, prison. Any other organizations that you belong to? No other organization. Okay. So I see that you have a transition plan with your sister, Jessica Dickens. 
in Sorrento, Louisiana, and you'll be living with your sister and your nephews. Is that correct? Yes, sir. My sister and her uh, three kids. Okay. And I see you'll be working with a catering company. Um, are you cooking? Is that correct? Yes, sir. I see where good institutional record, the work supervisor, security supervisor, and the classification officer says we have no issues with Ms. Dickinson. So you've done very well as far as uh, your disciplinary record while incarceration. Uh, I see where you've had multiple substance abuse education programs, living in balance, I celebrate recovery. Have you ever had a problem with illegal drug or abused alcohol? Yes, I did. Back then, yes, I did. And what at what age did you start using drugs? I think I was 18. So you had graduated from high school? After high school, yes, sir. Okay. And what what was your drug of choice? Marijuana. Anything stronger? I had tried cocaine. How long did you use cocaine? Um, it wasn't long. Do you feel as though that Celebrate Recovery and Living in Balance sufficiently gave you enough ammunition to maintain your sobriety if and when you released? Yes, sir. So what is your ongoing sobriety plan? Uh, getting to support groups. So tell me about that. Tell me what your plan is. Um, if released, I'm gonna find a support group uh, with other uh, individuals that went through what I've been through, um, surrounding myself around people that are Positive and encouraging. Are you drug addict today? No, sir. Are you drug addict today? No, sir. You think you're completely cured? If you still know you have to address the concern, like, like if you're always an addict, or do you think you're completely? Free of it. Yes, I'm completely free of it, sir. But after I get out, you know, I still want to be able to go to a support group. Let me give you some important advice. You must recognize that you'll be a drug addict the rest of your life. And you must treat it as a disease. And you must be vigilant each and every day. You will be attending AA and NA meetings for the rest of your life. <clears throat> you need to get a good sponsor. So when you get the urge, a stressful situation comes up, you have somebody to talk to. Yes, you're not, you'll never be cured. It is an ongoing situation that you will have for the rest of your life. Do you understand that? Yes, sir, I do. Now, when somebody asks you whether you're a drug addict, you say yes. You are a recovering drug addict. There's a difference. Okay? Yes, sir. 
Warren Thomas, do you have any comments, concerns, remarks, or observations? Yes, sir. Good morning. Um, I know Ms. Dickerson is um, quite nervous this morning, but she has done um, quite a lot of notable things here. You had mentioned the serve save for bachelor's degree, which is quite accomplishment. Um, NCCER certifications. Her one uh, Schedule A write-up was actually for a late uh, library book. So she, we've not had any disciplinary with her whatsoever. Um, she never shies away from work. Uh, actually, after the prison had flooded in 16 and um, we had the lady still housed at Hunt, she took care of the groundskeeping over there. I think it was only four on the crew. It was not many. Never complained about a days of work. Um, Ms. Dickerson and I actually spoke last week at length and um, her and I talked about all the things she's done here. And I think she's really done a tremendous job and taken um, advantage of everything that we have to offer. Thank you, Warren Thomas. Thank you. Uh, I've heard about the crew that stayed behind in 2016 and I have a lot of admiration for that crew because it, it was not an easy task. Yes, sir. So I'm gonna leave you with one thing. You might be in trouble. You had a late library book. <laughs> 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 and, and you're talking to a, a person that was a librarian for 35 years. <laughs> we were just happy she was using the library. <laughs> it was a good book. Maybe she wanted to read it twice. <laughs> Um, thank, thank you, Ms. Dickerson. Uh, I appreciate the conversation and I appreciate the honesty, okay? Yes, sir. Madam Chairman, I do have a recommendation in this case and I will share it with my fellow board members at the conclusion of this interview. Mr. Mm -hmm. Shagrin, may I ask you a couple questions? Good morning, um, Ms. Dickerson. How are you? Can you, hear, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay, I'm, I'm, I can tell you're having some issues with the volume on your side. On your side. Uh, let me ask you this. Um, I see that you completed uh, the trauma healing uh, program. You completed a lot of programs. You know, domestic relationships can be very difficult. I mean, you and the, the deceased in this case had a lot of issues in that area. And it seems as if you had a lot of anger yourself. So are you still a young woman? And there will probably be other relationships in your future. What have you learned over the last 15 and a half years from the programs that you've taken that would help you um, in your personal relationships so that you avoid the same kind of issues that you have with the victim? What do you need to change in the relationship in order to make it a healthy relationship? What do you think you would need to change uh, from your side of the equation? Um, first, not to react so quickly, to have time to think before responding. Um, I'm sorry. Hey. I'm not the same person I was before. In each class that I, I've taken to help, I took very seriously. And I grew from what I used to be to who I am now. And my thing was always reacting so negative instead of just think and make better choices. Well, do you understand that not every relationship is a healthy relationship? 
Yes, ma'am. Have you learned what a healthy relationship should look like? Yes, ma'am. What should it look like? Understanding, <laughs> love, communication. You know, sometimes in relationships, you want to change the other person. But the only person you can really change is yourself. And if that other person doesn't fit the mold that you need that person to be, maybe that's not the person that you should be with. Okay? Yes, ma'am. That's all I have, Mrs. Renatz. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mentioned you had two folks that could speak on your behalf when actually it's three. So be thinking about that. I'm going to call on your sister, Jessica, uh, first to say whatever she'd like us to know. And then you can tell me who the third person will be. Yes, ma'am. Jessica. Good morning. Good morning. Go ahead. Um, uh, my name is Jessica Dickerson. Um, I'm one of Tiffany's siblings. And um, I would like to say that there's no amount of time that can ever um, change or justify what took place. Um, knowing my sister then and now, I can honestly say that I see that Tiffany has learned how to take accountability. And in doing so, there were some things that she discovered about herself that she was blind to. Within the 15 years, my sister has progressed and she has learned that it is okay not to be okay. And that a simple conversation can go a long way. Um, behind these walls, you guys have given her the tools that she needs to be able to communicate effectively to be able to voice her opinion and understand that it is her opinion and it is okay if someone else's opinion is different and that you cannot approach everybody the same way. It's not what you do, it's how you do it. The years that she has been incarcerated, she has exemplified mm -hmm. and she, even though everything takes time, nothing is ever easy. I believe in my heart that she has exemplified that she's willing to do the work and that she's going to continue to do the work with the support of her family. I have been willing and I am willing to open up my home and my business to her because she got to live with what she did every day of her life. She can't take it back. Is she sorry? I know in my heart that she is. And had someone given her the tools that she needed not making any excuses, but if she would have had enough support to deal with her own battles, this would not have happened. I know that in my heart, you know, I, she's going to be with me and I'm willing to do whatever it takes. If I got to go to a meeting with her, I will. My opinion would still be the same if this is not my sister but I know what she's capable of and the Tiffany that she has become. It took a life to save a life. And in my heart, I am, there's no amount of words that can say how I feel about what happened. But this has definitely saved her life. This has allowed her to come many obstacles that she was facing. And she's given a second chance to get it right. And I know she's going to get it right. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Well said. All right, Lisa Johnson, please. Good morning. I'm uh, speaking on behalf of Tiffany. We are family. And as her sister said, she has had a lot of obstacles in her life. I was close to Tiffany before she did what she did and I remain her friend now and her cousin. And throughout the visits that I've had with Tiffany, she always speaks about what she did 
and she wished she could take it back, but she can't. She always talked about the remorse that she feels for Brian's family. And I feel like on this side, we, we both families have lost something. That family lost their, their son, their brother, their, their dad, and he can't come back. We still have a chance to touch and feel Tiffany. So, but I try to put myself in their place and which I can't because I, I, I never lost someone to that magnitude. But I do know that Tiffany is, is sorry. And if she could reach out to everyone in the family, she could, but she, she knows that she cannot. Um, and being incarcerated with Tiffany, I also agree that she's not the same person that she was when she, before incarceration, she has changed a great deal. She has learned how to heal, how to interact, interact with a lot of she with a lot of women being incarcerated. And she explained to us that when you're incarcerated, when you in a place where there's a lot of women, it's hard to be in a place with a lot of women at the same time. She knows how to turn away from trouble and how to not start trouble. And the programs, she did talk about programs as well that she needs to get into after being incarcerated, such as you know drugs. And she wants to give back. She wants to talk to um, drug addicted individuals to tell her story. Domestic abuse uh, victims, she wants to talk to them and tell her story. And she feels like she has a lot to give to society and to give back. She wants to give back. And she prayed and her family has prayed. And we just thank you for this opportunity to speak on her behalf. And I, I do in my heart believe that she has changed and she is remorseful and she knows that she can't change what has happened. But yes, I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Johnson. You're welcome. Tiffany, somebody else, do you have somebody else you'd like to speak? Yes. Gregory Jones. Okay. I'm sorry. Good morning. Morning. My name is Gregory Jones. I'm the uncle of Tiffany Dickerson. I'm going to speak on her behalf, not as her being my niece, but uh, on behalf of her being a person. Within the 15 and a half years that she has been incorporated, I discovered that she has the attitude now of being more conscious, more remorse of having uh, feelings for other people. Uh, on many occasions, we talked. Uh, many occasions, she was down. And I always encouraged her to keep her head up. I encouraged her while she was in incarcerated that every program that they offer her that she needed to take it because of her achievement, it goes a long ways in life. I got her to understand that uh, while she was incarcerated, to keep her circle small, do not allow everyone to come in her circle because if you allow, allow everyone to come in within her circle, that brings on trouble. Everyone don't does not want to see you move to the next level. And I just think that uh, within these 15 years and 15 and a half years, she have grown a lot. She have learned to love. She have learned to appreciate. She have learned to understand the, uh, about other folks, the situations and circumstances. She have learned not to react to different situations 
because she know that it's not hers. It's nothing that she can do with it. I, I just think that she, uh, I just think that she have come and grown uh, a long, long ways. And I appreciate this opportunity to speak on her behalf. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. At this time, we'll hear from the opposition. We do have uh, some folks representing the victim and the DA's office. Um, could we hear from uh, Ms. Suma Edmonds first? Good morning. Morning. October 16, 2007, 15 years ago, 5,682 days have passed and that date still lingers fresh in my memory. The tragedy that happened, it's tainted and severed my family's heart. It left a stain. We bear a hole that time can never heal. The void is filled with trauma, grief, and pain. Pain that cuts so deep. Today, we re relive that pain. Today I show up for my father, Brian Ozma, a victim of an egregious crime, a life that ended in the hands of T Tiffany Dickerson, a life deserving of more life. No amount of rehabilitation equates to the reality of losing my father and the long-standing impact this will forever have on my family. On behalf of myself and my family, we stand in opposition. Thank you, ma'am. That was difficult. And we have Ms. Veronica Duncan. Uh, um, good morning, everyone. Um, and thank you for the opportunity um, to speak. So Brian um, is my brother. Um, he was just the smart and most laid back person that I knew. Um, he was just a peaceful soul at heart. Um, in fact, as kids to adults, we, we have the same character traits, which is just being somewhat introverts, right? Which makes this extremely hard because it brings up all of these emotions. Um, just losing my brother to this extremely senseless and violent crime just, it's impacted the way that I see the world, right? Um, we didn't, just didn't get a chance to grow old together. Um, he just meant so much to me and my family. Um, he is missed, he's loved, and we continue to mourn his death, as you can see. He just didn't deserve this. Um, I just think the measure of a person's actions speak to their character. Right. And, and let's be clear, we can't measure a person's true intent with classes or even tears. Right. In a controlled environment, you just you can't measure that. And at best, I do believe in redemption. Right. But I just think that, you know, she should be held accountable for the full term of her sentence. That's just how it works in the real world. In life. Um, and again, it's not like she got a life sentence. You know, she obviously have you know, friends and family, you know, and she does get the opportunity to go home, we have the latter. So again, um, echoing what Summer um, said, we just were in opposition of this hearing. So thank you. Thank you. We appreciate your testimony. Uh, and from the DA's office, please. Unmute. Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Good morning. Thank you for allowing us to participate as well. Um, I, I want to just kind of reiterate what the two uh, members of the victim's family talked about. I think they use words like egregious and senseless. Uh, I, I want to point out, and I don't have much to say, but this was originally uh, an indictment for second degree murder. And at the time, we felt that the evidence strongly supported a second degree murder. Having listened to Ms. Dickerson about what happened that night, it's still a second degree murder. What she described was not a manslaughter. It was not a justified killing. It was a senseless and egregious killing, which is what the, the two previous members of the victim's family just uh, talked about. Um, we 
have shown, and, and I, I get the situation defendants in, like a lot of defendants, there, there are other things to consider. The state's already shown understanding and compassion towards Ms. Dickerson. We amended the charge, even though it could very well go forward as a secondary murder, to a manslaughter. And this was a, a, a negotiated plea for 25 years, not even the maximum on a manslaughter. So we would oppose any further com uh, commutation of the sentence. And it's our position that we would expect her to serve the sentence agreed to. And that's, that's all I have. Thank you for letting me talk. I really do appreciate your participation. Ms. Dickerson, is there something you'd like to say to us before we vote? Yes. First of all, I thank you all for giving me the opportunity to come before you. I've made many mistakes in my life, but there's no excuse for taking Brian's. I hold myself accountable for it all. Since the day it happened, I've been deeply remorseful and I deserve to feel responsible for the rest of my life. I've asked myself, why should I be given another chance? I'm not the same person before I can. Rehabilitation became a priority. I cannot change the past. And I wish I could take it all back, but I can't. Saying I'm sorry won't take away the trauma and emotional pain I've caused. Willa Mae, Lonnie, Puppy Summer, Jane, and the rest of the family. But I'm beyond sorry. She's finished. Okay, thank you. All right, I think we are prepared to vote. Uh, Mr. Rush, I will be voting first. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, Ms. Dickerson, I have two daughters that are older than you. So I want to give you some, some pearl, pearls of wisdom before I, I vote. First of all, hold your head up. Hold your head up. You mean hang your head and hold your hold your head up. Second is this Jackson H2. How do you recognize a a a, a favorable or a good relationship? You forgot one word, respect. Two individuals have to respect each other. Each relationship, it's gonna be different opinions, different ways of doing things. You're gonna like different foods. Respect the individual that you're in relationship with. Third, don't forget forget our, our conversation about drug addiction. Okay? Yes, based, upon, based upon the positive remarks of Warren Thomas, based on an excellent disciplinary conduct with only one law right, law class write-up in 15 and a half years, even though it was a late library book, a low risk assessment, a great transition plan with your system. My recommendation is that we commute your sentence to 24 years with no eligibility after serving 16 years. That is my recommendation. <clears throat> Mr. Roche, Mr. Freeman. Uh, I concur with Mr. Roche's recommendation. Mrs. Jackson. Uh, I'd like to thank the victim's family for being here and providing your input. And it certainly helps us um, to be balanced in our decision making. Um, but looking at who Ms. Dickerson is today and the things that she has 
walked on to improve herself. Amaro, likewise, it's the same. Thank you, Ms. Jackson. Um, I do agree. Uh, I really appreciate the warden's input. Um, she said some really good things about you. It's obvious to me that um, I think you're ready. My vote is the same for all the same reasons. So we'll make that recommendation on your behalf. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else feel like you could have just watched a uh, future Courtney Clenny hearing? She's the uh, OnlyFans model that also stabs her significant other one time with a butcher knife. Richard found this for me. It's an article here. And uh, it was on 2009, 2021. The woman received 25 year prison sentence for her boyfriend, a Monday for her, for her boyfriend's October 20, 2007 stabbing. Uh, she was 36. This is not when she pleaded guilty. This is not a young woman, like a girl. I mean, it's a young lady. She's 34 when she did it, I guess. Yep. You would think you'd be mature enough not to put a butcher knife in your boyfriend because he changed the channel. Plead guilty. District Judge Booth Simpson's court prior to schedule started for second degree murder trial. She would receive mandatory life had a jury convicted her. Um, she killed her longtime boyfriend with a steak knife. Azima died from a single stab wound to his upper torso despite emergency responders attempting to revive him. Following her court appearance, Dickerson returned to the parish jail where she'd been held. Okay. Um, state laws define manslaughter as an offense committed in sudden passion heat or blood immediately cause provocation sufficient to deprive an average person of self-control. Manslaughter is unlike murder, is committed without intent to commit great bodily harm. It carries prison 10 to 40 years. Following the stab, a neighbor describes Zima Dickerson as high school sweethearts who seem to have a loving relationship. Took a more volatile turn once they were inside their lime green home. Um... The family members said, that's it I could find on it. That is it I could find on it. Yeah. So, you know, the first things that I guess I want to touch on is just the contrast, the difference between the victim statements, her family members, the daughter, sister and district attorney, their statements were just from the soul. They were concise. They were, there was no fluff on it. They were so real. And then you, you hear about then the supporting statements and the things that were said just kind of make me sick. And one thing that she actually said was, it took a life to save her life. Who says that? It took a life to save her life. I mean, he's like, he's, he was, he was the sacrificial lamb. And this whole thing was about me, 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 like, like the, 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 the DA said, they gave her 25 years. That was a deal. They should give her, she should keep her 25 years. Remember, this is a commutation hearing. So what it means, now the governor needs to sign off on it. We don't know when that happens. 
sometimes it doesn't happen. Right, they make a recommendation to the governor. The governor needs to sign off on it. Then she has another parole hearing because this isn't a parole hearing, it's a computation hearing. So then she would have a parole hearing scheduled. And as long as she doesn't have any like write-ups or anything, it's pretty much a quick hearing. They can sometimes be just like under 10 minutes. Sometimes the victims don't show up because they just feel too defeated to, to show up. But we've seen victims show up as well. And just to make a statement, and it's so unfair to the victims to put them through this again, yet another time for the parole hearing, if the governor signs off on it. Now, you might say, well, why wouldn't the governor sign off on it? In this case, I would just assume he would. But governors sometimes, like I've heard stories where they just don't get to it for whatever reason. They just don't do it and they leave office and, you know, you, you don't really understand what's going on behind closed doors or if they just somehow it's paperwork got lost. Uh, other things were just very unimpressive. I mean, the addict question, that's like 101. If you're paying any attention to your programs, to your classes, you would know to say, I'm an addict. And she failed miserably. She It was like completely overhead. And she was given chances. The warden even like gave her like three hints. And, and what does that tell me? I don't know. It seems to me that she just wasn't paying any attention at all and really has no um, intention of maintaining sobriety and taking that seriously. That's just my takeaway. Now, was it drugs that caused her to do this? It might not have been. It would, you know, I think it would have been better if it was. At least she'd have some type of excuse. I think this was straight up a uh, kind of like a Courtney Clenny thing. Someone with a huge jealousy issues, huge anger problems, uh, impulse problems. She got mad. And she stabbed him. And you heard his relatives talk. They were they really were spoke elegantly. And if he was anything like them, it. Uh, and we heard about you know it was interesting when it first happened. They were investigating it like you know. We don't know what she said. Did she blame it on him? Did she say that he was attacked? Did she call the paramedics right away? Did she make up a story? Like a lot of those details are important to me too, but we don't have any of them. And it does seem from here that she was the abuser. If you want to give any credit to her, it would be that she didn't try to dirty his knee, his name. I didn't hear them say that he was abusive, that it was a mutually abusive relationship. We've seen some of these things where they can go sideways and we didn't see any of that. She did seem to take accountability. I mean, she was crying at the beginning and Mr. Rochet kind of let her off without going into too much details, but it didn't seem that she made excuses to me. One of her relatives started to go into, we both lost someone. It's like, no, that's not, that's not how it works. You didn't both lose someone. She got a 25 year sentence. You see her, you can see her as much as you want. You can even hold her, hug her. I, I believe they have there's occasions to do that. And, and you, you had a light at the end of the tunnel because she was always going to get out. You know, it wasn't so long ago when you would have family members take a ship and cross the country at their own choice and you would never see them again. And you might get a few letters every year. If you're lucky, 
that was just a part of life. You got it better than they do. You you have phone calls and meetings and can't compare the two. It's just it it blows my mind when you have victim when you have statements like that. It just shows this complete. Now she did lead into how it wasn't the same, and but still, just to go down that path. I mean, did you not hear her daughter? That was one of the most. I mean, she still, she still, it's just, I feel like she was victimized all over again by this ruling. And I give kudos to the DA for getting up there and speaking because so many times they don't, maybe even 90% of the times they don't. Uh, I'd have to tally it up, but at least to be there and support of the victim to do the right thing so she's not there alone. Yeah, Mr. O'Shea was a, a, a court librarian for all those years, and then he does this interesting tidbit. And uh, I was hoping he would deny her because um, of that late book. It was interesting. He's 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 an advocate for the victim, but you know this is also a different kind of case. If you've noticed, there are only four members, and for these clemency hearings, there are usually five. And the difference is, is that you need four to get the vote. When you have five, you can you can have one vote no and four vote yes and still get the vote. So this leaves the board, in my opinion, with less room to play tactical chess, tactful chess, like tactful games kind of, where you can have Mr. O'Shea as the victim's advocate say no um, to give some type of backing for the victim and have the other four say yes. But I guess they just felt that that he she had served enough time and she's not a threat to society. And that she doesn't need to serve the full 25 years. I mean, I guess that's just what it comes down to. They say three things, you're punishing them, you're protecting, you lock them up because you're punishing them, you're protecting others, and uh, you have to rehabilitate. I don't know, you think that she's been rehabilitated? It's, you know, someone who does that, they have so many deep rooted issues, trust issues, anger, impulsive issues insecurities it's like has that really been fixed if you think it was a drug issues i would argue that it hasn't because she didn't know the most basic simple answer to the most basic simple question are you an addict nope she she didn't even know how to pretend fake it she didn't get one write up which does show something that's interesting. I can imagine, you know, she got like that one right up for the book, but there was no fighting. There was no. I would say just for the victim, you should have kept her locked up, really. It's, uh, I mean, it would have been another 10 years. And if the victim wants it, the victim wants it. 15 years for taking a life. Whether it's by stabbing them or any way. I would just say it's not enough.
I'd love to hear your thoughts on this. And with that, I'll let you go.